Hello everyone, my name is JJ, and today we are doing part three of my incredibly overambitious plan to profile the leaders of every country in the world. We have done all of the A's and part of the B's, so now let us pick up where we left off. So, country number 23, Botswana. The president of the African nation of Botswana is Mokwetsi Masisi. He is the country's former vice president and has only been in power since April when the previous president resigned. Botswana is considered one of Africa's freest countries, but it is also a bit of a one-party state, considering that every single presidential election since the country became independent from Great Britain in 1966 has been won by the same party, the Botswana Democrats. President Masisi is considered a very establishment sort of guy, coming as he does from a family of prominent Botswana Democrats. Before he got involved in politics, he was educated in the United Kingdom and the US as an educationist which is a term I'd never heard before, but is apparently somebody who specializes in education policy. But anyway, Masisi is basically seen as just a not very interesting status quo all the way sort of guy. He doesn't seem like the kind of guy that will offer a lot of change from the path that Botswana has already been on for the last 52 years. But like I said, Botswana is a free country, so if their people just keep voting the same old party back into power again and again and again, what are you gonna do? Country number 24 is Brazil. All right, so Brazil's president is a guy called Michel Temer. He assumed office in May of 2016 after the old president was impeached. Temer is an extraordinarily unpopular man in Brazil right now. I think his approval rating is like literally at 2%. Now, I know I have a lot of Brazilian viewers, so please bear with me as I attempt to get his story right. If I get anything wrong, please let me know in the comments. I'm sure you Brazilians have a lot to say on this man. So first, the political stuff. Temer is 78 years old and has basically been in politics all his life. First in the state government of Sao Paulo and then in the federal government. Government. He served 23 years in Congress, including three terms as Speaker of the House, before being elected Vice President in 2011 as the running mate of Socialist candidate Dilma Rousseff. Temer is not a Socialist himself, he is considered to come from a more conservative political party, but back in 2011, those two parties had a political alliance. But then in 2016, President Rousseff got caught up in this giant bribery scandal, and Temer's party cut all ties to her. They basically threw her under the bus completely, in fact. All of their politicians voted in favor of her impeachment, which made Temer president, which was seen as a real power play. But then last year, a tape came out that seemed to reveal that Temer himself was much more deeply involved in the bribery scandal than had been previously known. Since then, there have been repeated attempts in Congress to impeach him too, but so far all of them have failed. Now this is a very superficial overview because the politics of Brazil particularly the politics of Brazilian scandals, are very complicated. So let's instead talk a bit about President Temer's personal life. He is Brazil's first Arab Brazilian president, born to immigrants from Lebanon. He is also quite well known for his third and current wife, who is a former beauty queen, a fair bit younger than he is, which is to say 40 years younger than he is, but she clearly loves him very much. I mean, look, she even got his name tattooed on her neck. You don't see Melania doing that. Country number 25, Brunei. Brunei is a small country on the northern tip of Malaysia. It is one of the few countries in the world that is ruled by a sultan. The current sultan of Brunei is uh, Sir Hassano Bolkaya Muzadin Walada. He became sultan in 1967 when his father died, and he is the world's second longest serving monarch after Queen Elizabeth. He is also one of the world's richest men, valued at over $20 billion, most of which he has just taken from his own country, which has a lot of oil. Now, without putting too fine a point on it, the Sultan of Brunei is basically just a big sack of human garbage. He's a big, rich, spoiled moron who does nothing but spend his country's money buying himself a lot of gold-plated nonsense in between having sex with underage prostitutes. And anyone who criticizes him is thrown in prison. Brunei is a very rich place, but the incredible self-centeredness of its ruler has turned this once promising country into a sort of back to the future part two-esque dystopia with very few redeeming qualities. In 2014, the Sultan decided to become an Islamic fundamentalist for some reason and impose Sharia law on his country, making his dictatorship even more insufferable. I particularly like this quote from Reza Aslan in the New York Post. This is obviously not coming from a place of religious devotion since the Sultan himself is in violation of every single rule of Sharia law you could possibly imagine. Number 26, Bulgaria. The Prime Minister of Bulgaria is Boyko Borisov. He's been kinda sorta in power since 2009. I say kinda sorta because on two non-consecutive occasions he has symbolically resigned for a few months only to be promptly re-elected back to power. Borisov kind of embodies a distinct mix of a few different currents in European politics right now. 
on the one hand, he is super pro-EU and super anti-Russia, but then on the other hand, he is in a coalition government with an anti-immigration, anti-Islam populist party. The Prime Minister is a popular guy overall and has a pretty engaging, charismatic personality. They call him Batman because he has a sort of macho superhero type lifestyle. Before he got into politics, he worked as a cop and a firefighter and a bodyguard for Bulgarian VIPs. He is a black belt in karate, and during one of his brief resignations, he played professional soccer for one of the Bulgarian football teams. Number 27, Burkina Faso. So Burkina Faso is another one of these African countries that has only recently liberated itself from the rule of a longtime dictator. In Burkina Faso's case, that was the dictatorship of President Blaise Compaore, who was in power from 1987 to 2014, when he was overthrown by a mass popular uprising. And one of the key leaders of that uprising was one of President Compaore's own cabinet ministers, a guy named Roche Mark Christian Kabore. And after Compaore was thrown out, Kabore was elected in his place. The fact that Kabore was willing to quit the dictator's cabinet out of principle was seen as a good sign that he was like this big reformer. But on the other hand, the fact that he had served in that administration for 30 straight years was also sort of seen as evidence that maybe he wasn't quite such a break with the past as he seemed. Number 28, Burundi. Burundi is another African country, a tiny little place located just north of Rwanda. Their president is named Pierre Nkurunziza. So much like Rwanda, Burundi is a country that has been torn by brutal ethnic violence between the Hutu and Tutsi people. And Pierre Nkurunziza was a longtime Hutu rebel leader who was fighting against the Tutsi dominated government. In 2004, the government signed a peace treaty with his group, and then in 2005, Nkurunziza was elected president. Despite his background, Nkurunziza has tried to lead a government of national unity and wind down the civil war, but the fact that he has decided to rule as a brutal dictator has just plunged the country into a whole new kind of civil war, with the government trying to kill or jail anyone who opposes it. In an effort to end this new era of violence, last month Nkurunziza agreed to step down in 2020. Number 29, Cabo Verde, or as we used to call it, Cape Verde. A lot of countries do not like having their country's name translated into English anymore and have explicitly asked that we stop doing that. Anyway, the president of this tiny former Portuguese colony is Jorge Carlos Fonseca, who has been in power since 2011. His life is sort of interesting because it's a real testament to the continued relevance of the former Portuguese empire. So Fonseca was born in Cape Verde and as a young man, he was active in the PAIGC party, which was agitating for the independence of both Cape Verde and Guinea-Bissau to close by colonies in the former Portuguese Africa. And after a brief stint working in the first post-independence government of Cape Verde, he moved to Portugal, where he served as a law professor at the University of Lisbon. And while he was there, he met his wife, who was a woman from the former Portuguese colony of Mozambique. And then the couple moved to the Macau region of China, which in those days was in its final years of Portuguese rule. And while he was there, Dr. Fonseca helped the UN write the constitution of the newly independent country of East Timor, which was just leaving Portuguese rule as well. And then he moved back to Cape Verde and became their president. So he's basically one of the great globalist intellectuals of the Portuguese speaking world. Number 30, Cambodia. So the leader of Cambodia is a guy named Hun Sen. He's been in power in some form or another since 1984, shortly after the fall of the radical communist dictator Pol Pot. Cambodian political history is really difficult to summarize because Cambodia has had more political systems than any other country in the world. I think they were even in the Guinness Book of World Records for this, but basically after the fall of Pol Pot, there was a lot of political tension between the sort of moderate anti-Pol Pot communists, which is what Hun Sen was, and supporters of the former Cambodian royal family. And over the last three decades, Hun Sen has systematically sidelined his royalist rivals, and everyone else who opposes him for that matter, and consolidated all power in himself. He is not much of a communist anymore, but rather a sort of swaggering, macho, Hugo Chavez type guy, prone to extreme childlike vanity and long, rambling speeches. He likes fancy uniforms and having people call him Lord Prime Minister. And like Chavez, he is also furiously anti-American. These days, a lot of people say that his government is perhaps China's most obedient puppet. Number 31, Cameroon, another African country. The president of Cameroon is Paul Bia. He is 85 years old and has been in power since 1982, the second longest ruling African leader. Bumped up a spot recently now that old man Mugabe's gone. So basically the usual sort of story with this guy. Educated in Europe during the colonial times, then moved back to be part of his country's first post-independence government. Bia was promoted rapidly through the ranks of the administration of Cameroon's first president, 
eventually becoming his second in command. And then when the president stepped down, Bia took over. And in the three decades since, President Bia proceeded to establish a brutal dictatorship marked by chronic oppression of human rights and rank systemic fraud and corruption. His government has also proceeded to get increasingly lazy and decadent as the years go by and the president gets older and older. Apparently a popular nickname for him is president of the Hotel Intercontinental since he spends so much time vacationing in Europe instead of bothering to run his own country. Number 32, Canada. Oh boy, it is my country. So Canada is of course ruled by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. He has been in power since late 2015. Justin Trudeau is probably the most famous Prime Minister Canada has produced in decades. To find a Canadian leader equally well known, you'd have to go all the way back to his father, who was the former Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who ran the country from 1968 to 1984. Justin Trudeau never showed much interest in politics as a young man, but everybody figured he'd probably run for Prime Minister someday, just because his family was so famous. His critics used to laugh him off because he had so little political experience and wasn't a great speaker, but when he actually did run for Prime Minister in 2015, he wound up winning by a much larger margin than anyone expected. Like his father, Justin Trudeau is considered quite the left-winger, but in a much more modern, identity politics-focused kind of way. He is considered very preoccupied with being very sensitive and politically correct all the time. And his administration has made a particularly big show about being concerned with the needs of women, and Muslims, and LGBT people, and Canadian Indians. This is very popular with progressive voters who go for this sort of thing and has a real nails on the chalkboard effect to everyone else. And lastly, number 33, the Central African Republic. The president of the CAR, or Central Afrique, as I am sure we will soon be required to call it, is a man with the wonderfully French name of Faustine Archange Touadera. He was elected in February of 2016. In contrast to some of the other African countries we've talked about today, the Central African Republic is a chronically politically unstable country. They have had many presidents and many coups and counter coups. It is also currently attempting to wind down some long-standing violence between its Christian and Muslim populations. But a lot of people will say that as of now, the country is basically a failed state. President Touadera who is a former professor and cabinet minister, was elected following the overthrow of the previous Muslim government. He is seen as this very peace-oriented, conciliatory guy dedicated to making things better. But, you know, that's going to be pretty hard to do, considering the Central African government has very little authority over its own country. They say over 80% of Central Africa is controlled by rebel militias, and then you have these international peacekeepers that are trying to keep a lid on things, which leaves the government sort of off on the sidelines. The big thing in the news recently is that President Touadera is apparently trying to cut a deal with the Russians to provide more stability to his country. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, so wow, that was 11 more world leaders for you. Just... 160 left to go. But before I end this video, I just wanted to say one more thing to you guys, some real talk for a second. So in researching this batch of leaders, I was reminded that there are a lot of places in this world where people live under these monstrously oppressive and really quite criminally incompetent governments. Governments whose evil and indifference to human suffering makes life such hell for their citizens that in many cases the sanest response is to just risk your life and try to escape. Here in the West we do like to complain that our governments are very oppressive and that we barely have any freedom left these days and other overblown nonsense like that, but no. We actually have it pretty good. Take a moment out of your day and just be grateful for that.